is the economy as currently organized actually serving human needs? The most controlling assumption today underlying most economic activities and indeed most policy making is that growth is good. Not only good, but essential. Essential for prosperity and progress. Around the world, nations have hitched their wagons to this very idea. And they continue to do so, even though there's mounting evidence that this obsession with growth may actually drive us off the cliff. It's not enough to be critical of or even oppose the consequences of this assumptions. In order to change the direction of our collective journey, we have to come to grips with the history of the assumption and the many ways in which this assumption lodged its way into prevailing thought and economic systems around the world, from the personal to the political. There's a wide range of things that can be grown. Those things can be good, bad, or indifferent. No doubt when politicians or economists around the world talk about growth, they predictably reflect a range of cultural and ideological differences and they imagine different types of growth and certainly want growth for very different reasons. Lift people out of poverty, perhaps, or generate the money necessary to build a strong military force. Oxford University's Kay Rayworth, I believe in this very room, has noted how world leaders are adding forever more qualifiers to their call for more growth. They now talk about sustainable growth and green growth or balanced growth. But if we want to know what exactly they mean by that, we have to investigate how they measure growth. In order to know whether something is growing, one needs clearly defined metrics. From Buenos Aires to Washington, from Beijing to London, governments around the world measure growth in ways that are almost identical. Gross domestic product or GDP. The key thing to observe here is that qualifiers like green or balanced merely speak to speed or makeup of the train, but not to the universal goal of exponential growth. For me, as a historian, it raised a fascinating question. Has there ever been a single set of values, a single paradigm, or a single ideology, if you will, that is as universal as the aspiration to grow GDP? I'm not sure what the answer is, but as a number, GDP's importance is likely unrivaled in the world. So returning to our initial question, if someone says we need to grow GDP, the immediate question should be, what are you asking us to grow and why? Though likely one of the most important political questions, what does GDP growth mean, is rarely asked. On the contrary, we can find that the benefits of GDP growth are routinely just simply taken for granted. GDP growth is necessary for prosperity, they say. Or do you want the poor of the world to stay in misery by denying them the benefits of growth? Most of you have probably heard the standard definition, which is GDP measures goods and services produced. Economists put this into a deceptively simple formula. What GDP measures, it turns out, is simply output. GDP does not measure quality. It does not measure real costs. It does not measure purpose. It's like saying activities at NHS way up. What activities are we talking about? Did more people get sick? Did they use more procedures? Or did they hire more people? What above all was the result? Were people better off or worse off? According to the reigning logic of GDP, the more we turn life into commodities, trees into lumber, fossils into fuel, human skills into wage labor, education into investments, the better. Things like oil spills, accidents, and addictions are among the most favorable events as measured by GDP. They require many goods and services that make GDP go up. When we use GDP as a measure of prosperity and welfare, as we do, divorce is better than a happy marriage, long commutes are better than walking to work, plundering the planet is better than safeguarding the ecosystem for future generations. It's this very logic that defines mainstream understandings of prosperity and progress. It is a logic at its core that needs people to live beyond their means and nature to be pushed beyond its limits. The UK's former Economics Commissioner for Sustainable Development, Tim Jackson, recently summarized the consumption side of this logic. He said, quote, we spend money we don't have on things we don't need. 
in order to create impressions that won't last on people we don't care about. Now, assuming that we're not all insane, the key question then becomes, how did this happen? Without looking at origins, in fact, neither the nature nor the global reign of GDP makes any sense. The initial blueprint of GDP was developed in England and the US in response to a crisis so large that it was threatening to bring down entire societies. We now know this crisis as the Great Depression. A graph like this can trace the severity of the crisis, but, and this is important to note, at the time of the Great Depression, no one in government or business possessed any of this information. No one even knew basic things like actual numbers of unemployed, unused productive capacities, etc. And it was in this moment of great crisis that accountants Simon Kuznets in the US and Colin Clark in the UK, chief among them, put together the first sets of what they called national income and product accounts. It was, based on my research, an enormous and massive labor of love. Remember, these people had access only to the most rudimentary information. They had no computers, just some census data. Now, I thoroughly investigated how they put together these first accounts and realized that something was almost entirely missing from today's conversations about GDP. What they put together, the blueprint of GDP, was a result of compromise a result of limited data, and a result of profound disagreements on what to count and how to count it. Should we count housework? Or what is an end product, anyway? Today, most of these debates and disagreements are largely invisible, hidden behind a long, settled way of doing things. Bringing them back into light, we realize that GDP is not at all objective. In fact, the choices that went to in into its design are no less subjective as something like well-being or happiness surveys. And in some cases, they literally defy common sense, as when they count plundering of natural resources as a plus, or ignore most domestic labor, or consider military operations as a final product. At first, in other words, the blueprint of GDP provided vital, albeit very limited, information and was essential to dealing with depression and crisis. With German and Japanese aggression mounting in the late 1930s, the sudden imperative in both Britain and the US was to crank up military production of things like planes, tanks, and equipment. Accountants had gathered the necessary information to show war planners how exactly to do that. They showed how much steel and how many workers and what kind of machinery was necessary to produce, say, X number of tank turrets, all without starving civilian needs or taking away necessary resources from the production of other necessities like ships or guns. The economist Paul Samuelson was, did not exaggerate when he called World War II an economist's war. The US and Britain had the data, the Germans and the Japanese did not. This is a graph showing how the US outproduced its adversaries in planes. It turns out that GDP accounts are very, very good in cranking up output. But then even before World War II was over, all the old problems and many new ones knocked on the door. How to prevent another Great Depression? How to feed and employ all the returning veterans? Through various mechanisms, chief among them Bretton Woods, IMF, the World Bank, and the Marshall Plan, the short answer on which political leaders in the West settled was growth of output, growth of GDP. Because increased output offered a promise to nearly everyone. Jobs and incomes to workers, refrigerators and cars to consumers, profits to entrepreneurs, stability to politicians. The result between 1944 and the time of the, the Soviet Union collapse in 1992, every country in the world hitched its wagon to GDP growth. After the war, in short, GDP moved from a descriptive tool to a prescriptive target from measure to goal. Around the world, without debate about what it measured or how it came to be, the chief political and economic imperative became growth of GDP. GDP effectively replaced political deliberation about purpose and direction of economic activity. In other words, we essentially stopped asking the most basic question, what are we growing and why? For all practical purposes, in other words, the question of more of what disappeared from public debate. Without any debate, in fact, more became synonymous with better. 
more in the case of GDP represents not linear, but of course exponential growth. At a very conservative growth rate of 2%, a doubling of economic output every 35 years. By this logic, taking 1900 as the base year of one, this translates into economic output that is eight times as large by 2000, an incredible 64 times as large another 100 years later, and another 100 years later, 512 times as large. Of course, if the growth rate is 3%, the economic output in 2200 would have to be some 30,000 times as large. Now, it's a remarkable, not to say remarkably insane logic, yet it is what currently defines mainstream economic wisdom. One can see why the physics professor Albert Bartlett argued that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. The rationale underlying the logic of GDP growth, of course, was and is that increased consumption is good. Naomi Klein called it the ideology of the goods life rather than the good life. Former World Bank economist Herman Daly has pointed out that following this logic treats the earth like a business in liquidation. In practical terms, of course, it did not take long for exponential growth and output to run up against serious problems. Conflicts over markets, wars over resources, the limits imposed by a finite ecosystem, depletion of resources, degradation of soil, air, and water, and now most familiar to us, climate change. This is an illuminating way to show many of the hidden complexities and correlations between Earth system trends and socioeconomic trends. Here we see exponential growth of GDP really picking up steam after its invention. Here we see the same kind of growth in carbon dioxide emissions. And here the exponential intensification of ocean acidification. Remember, GDP does not account for any of these problems. On the contrary, its ledgers register as a plus things like resource exploitation, oil spills, and spending beyond our means. For all intents and purposes, I would argue, that was and is a global system of accounting without accountability. An analogy might actually help clarify the historical role of GDP. If a doctor prescribed a doubling of calories to a starving patient, say from 200 to 400 calories, no one would object. The same is true if the doctor's prescription would take the patient from 400 to 800 calories, or even from 800 to 1600. All this would be making the patient stronger, healthier, and more resilient. Except that at this point, we decided collectively to measure health by caloric intake. By the time the prescription would further double to 3,200 calories, some of you may begin to raise questions. But then once we double intake once more from 3,200 to 6,400 calories, most of us would probably agree this is eventually going to kill the patient. The problem is, by now, the entire healthcare system and the entire healthcare profession is premised on the idea that more calories translate into better health. The same logic applies to GDP. By using indiscriminate output as the core metric for goods, services, income, wealth, status, even prosperity, success, and progress, GDP is both outdated and dangerous. But, and just as important as the central metric defining the economy today, the very nexus where core challenges like inequality or climate change coalesce and come together, replacing GDP with smarter metrics also represents a unique opportunity for fundamental change. Time then to shift focus and begin looking forward. What we measure really matters for it largely determines what we aim for. It also defines what we get paid for. Leaving oil in the ground and protecting a healthy ecosystem does not count. Extracting and fracking and burning it does. Just imagine for a minute how different all of our lives would be if we turned that logic right side up. If we used available smart metrics that actually reflect what we want. Three well-established metrics make the point. So here we have a well-known metric of GDP per capita and change that metric just by a little bit and add things like foundations of well-being or basic human needs and the picture already changed quite considerably. Now add something like the health of the planet and something very interesting happens. The US actually ends up at the bottom of the list. A country surprisingly like Costa Rica with less than one-third of the per capita GDP of the US comes out at top. Here, I think it is worth remembering that none of the great economists or moral philosophers of the past considered growth 
a worthy goal for its own sake. Most merely saw it as a means to allow for human development. And they all understood that it had to come to an end. John Maynard Keynes, in his well-known letter to his grandchildren, called the love of money and growth and possessions a disgusting morbidity. And not exactly mincing words, described it as, quote, one of those semi-criminal, semi-pathological propensities that hopefully soon would be handed over with a shudder to the specialists in mental disease. The English economist Kenneth Boulding quipped, anyone who believes that exponential growth is possible on a finite planet is either insane or an economist. <laughs> but this is precisely where we are. Ask mainstream economists and politicians around the world what we need, and their answers are almost always premised on some version of economic growth. The very operating system of the GDP regime requires growth. In contrast, ask natural scientists, and they will give you some version of the fact that we need to stop growth, which I think points to the central contradiction of our time. Global economies that need to grow and a planet that simply cannot grow. And here it is worth remembering that it is up to us what economy we want to live in, while the parameters of the planet's ecosystem we change at our own peril. Of course, ultimately, the question of purpose goes far beyond growth or no growth. Rather than following the mindless goal of GDP growth, we could decide to have a broad conversation about the purposes of economic activities. Outside of the logic of the GDP regime, broad agreement on goals and direction is likely much less difficult than one would imagine. Again, smart measures matter a great deal, for they both inform and define our actions. People who understand the critical importance of metrics have accomplished impressive work. The Center for Sustainable Economy in the US put together the Genuine Progress Indicator, also bringing it down to one number, just like GDP, but it is a very sophisticated metric that adds all activities that contribute to well-being and subtracts activities that are harmful. They add things like volunteer work, but subtract things like income inequality. What their indicators show, among many other things, is that progress in the highly industrialized world essentially stopped sometime in the mid-1970s. The London-based New Economics Foundation, NEF, published a well-being manifesto putting well-being front and center of political decision-making. Are any of these alternative sets of indicators perfect? Absolutely not. But they are all infinitely preferable to GDP. With smarter goals in place, we may discover that universal human needs for things like strong and sustainable communities for the expansion of human capacities and meaningful work can be realized only once we break the spell of the little big number. We live in a time that seems to operate at a pace and scale that is almost gravity-defying. Therein lie, I would argue, both unparalleled dangers but also unparalleled possibilities and opportunities. Yes, as the Pope just recently reminded us, quote, our common home is at a breaking point, burdened and laid waste. But having conquered scarcity as the driving engine of history, what amazing opportunities we have. A world in which human beings can finally graduate to more pleasant and more rewarding tasks than working just to put food on the table and pay the bills keeping up with the Joneses and staying on top of your emails and Facebook contacts. Opportunities to develop dormant human potentials. And perhaps most importantly, to live in some kind of harmony with nature and not in conflict. Above all, toward a future that will provide opportunities to our children and grandchildren at least equal to our own. Surely, there's more to life than growing economic output. As my colleague Brent Lane concluded, it is time to retire GDP and its bag of assumptions as grandpa's definition of prosperity. <laughs> <laughs>